Welcome to the Wealth Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, John Lawson, Senior Wealth Advisor at Asante Capital Management and Sana Family Office. We're always looking for unique ways to educate our client families and be introduced to new clients. At Sana Family Office, we help business owners and affluent families navigate the complexities of wealth through a variety of wealth management and family enterprise oversight services. Today, we're speaking with Jeff Marshall from CI Global Asset Management. Jeff is a CFA and Senior Vice President, Head of Fixed Income and Lead in the Private Markets. Jeff brings over 25 years of valuable industry experience and most importantly for today's conversation was instrumental in bringing together a top tier world-class private markets offering to the mass affluent investor which is not something that has existed prior to this. Welcome, Jeff, and thanks for being our guest today. So let's start out uh, kind of basic and say, what are private markets? And uh, maybe even add to that, why should an investor uh, consider adding private markets into their portfolio? Sure thing. So the way to think about private markets is all the debt and all the ownership of companies that's not in the bond market and that's not in the the stock market. So, you know, private equity, for example, tends to be direct investments made in small to medium, even some large size businesses in some cases, again, in private companies that are not publicly traded stocks. So it can be for um, a a simple buyout. It can be an investment into a company to provide more growth capital. Um, It can be specialized into real estate or infrastructure assets like uh, energy transportation, pipelines, utilities, um, or into kind of the earlier stage parts of the market like, like venture capital, which is you know, a smaller part of what we do. On the debt side, the credit side, it's really the part of lending that's not in the bond market and not on the bank's balance sheet. So in some cases, these are companies that can't access traditional forms of, of debt financing, of, of borrowing, And so, you know, they tend to be uh, forced to borrow more expensively, which accrues to the benefit of of investors. And then you had a question on on why should investors consider investing? Um, This set of assets provides for a differentiated set of risk and returns, and and therein lies the opportunity. So as an industry, we tend to be maybe a little bit glib about talking about risk. Um, risk could mean many things, uh, but we tend to express it as, as volatility, right? How much does a portfolio or an individual asset move up and down in value? Um, and that's really what we can do by investing in the private markets. Investing in a private company is not really any less risky than um, investing in a public stock. The, just the valuation is going to move around a, a lot less. And, and really, at the heart of it, the volatility or the changes in the economic growth of a country, of a sector, uh, of a business is not, is a fraction of the volatility that we see in the public equity markets with stocks. And so this is investing into companies and lending to companies uh, that's I think a better reflection of the underlying volatility of their growth. Um, and th- we also pick up this, this benefit where these asset classes, private equity, private credit, venture capital, real estate, infrastructure, tend to have very low correlations to other parts of the public stock market. And so that means that you can put together portfolios that are better constructed, right, with low correlations, kind of the degree to which things move together, or negative correlations, things move in opposite directions, we can build portfolios that have less risk. So you can either be build portfolios with less risk and the same amount of return or the same amount of volatility and more return. So that's that's the why. Great explanation. Thank you. Um, and your, your reference to the public markets versus private, really what we've talked about in the past and, and you've talked uh, about uh, is uh, private market investors tend to use what we refer to as patient capital. 
Uh, so it's it's not looking for next quarter's returns. It's not. It doesn't have the same emotion that's in the publicly uh, traded markets. Uh, hence the lower volatility. Yeah, I think sometimes you know management teams can be pressured into selling an asset or making an acquisition or buying back stock. Things that might work in the short term to get their stock price higher, but actually in the long term are more detrimental. And, and private equity and, and private markets tend to be more immune uh, from that short-term behavior. Yeah, and, and there's multiple reasons for that, but let's, let's maybe talk a little bit um, uh, about why, uh, why and when did uh, uh, CI Asante start looking to, uh, into bringing private market solutions into Canada for our clients? Private assets have traditionally been held by pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, large institutional investors, and they either own the assets directly or they used external managers to manage, uh, spe uh, specialized managers to uh, run those assets. With the new products that we launched this year in September, we said we can add value um, with a multi-manager approach that we're not beholden to one manager. And by making tactical changes between various parts of private markets, private equity, private debt, uh, as we think, you know, as we see, you know, relative value, even within, you know, private credit, you know, what's more attractive, you know, direct lending or distressed, you know, opportunities. And we can, um, we believe we can add value that way with those tactical changes. Yeah. And, and to, to your point, sitting through uh, a dinner with a few of these uh, management teams and listening to the stories and how they approach um, the the debt side was fascinating because you can say general label they're going to deal with debt, but they approached it so differently. It was uh, it was fascinating, and I see how, where the uh, diversification comes from there. Maybe let's circle back. You referred to it a little bit, but uh, private markets is is not new. Um, endowment funds, pension funds, our Canada pension plan, which is one of the largest and best run uh, plans in the world. Um, and I know some people will have a hard time swallowing that, but uh, truly it is. It's gone through a, uh, a massive change uh, in the last 20 years. Their portfolios uh, they're 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 pushing uh, uh, just above just below fifty percent when you total up uh, all of their uh, private market uh, style investment. Well, I've got it right here. Yeah, it was two, it was two thousand ten. They were at twelve percent, and now just on the equity side, it's thirty three percent of their portfolio. We don't have the we don't have good transparency onto the debt side, but we think yeah. you know probably between private debt and private equity, it's it's north of 50%. And so they're seeing, you know, what we see is, you know, here's a collection of assets that are loosely correlated to the rest of their portfolio and put them together. It's, it's a more efficient solution. Yeah. And then there's one other thing I should mention, right? Which is most investors don't need to be 100% liquid with the entire, entirety of their investments, right? So mutual funds uh, by definition are, you know, liquid overnight. If, if all my clients want the money back, it, it's there. Um, liquidity in the private markets is, is, is more difficult, but I believe that's one thing you know, that's part of the reason why returns have generally been, been higher uh, because there's that liquidity premium. So generally what we're investing in is closed end funds that might um, be open for a year of fundraising and then slowly return the capital uh, really after year five, between year five and year seven. Um, and so we don't have immediate liquidity. Um, now we can help solve for that in terms of how we diversify our portfolio and some other securities that we'll hold in the portfolio. But I think that's um, a plan like Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, which is actually still in um, growth mode, harvesting mode. They're not actually net paying out to retirees yet. Uh, they don't need that liquidity. And I'd say most Canadian investors don't need to be completely liquid. Yeah, so it's it's a really good point. Maybe we'll touch on it right now. Uh, um, and of course, everybody has to speak to their advisor to make sure that this is appropriate for them. 
Um, but just general guidelines, one of the things that we've done is brought uh, the in, uh, access level down to 25,000 uh, US dollars for initial investment uh, into this, which if you look at the tiers uh, type of uh, uh, managers that uh, you guys have brought into the fold, uh, some of them don't even open up to anybody anymore. Uh, some of them, uh, you you need um, 100 million, uh, 50 million, 25 million, whatever, but it's a lot more money than what we would refer to as the mass affluent would ever be able to do. And Correct. in those, uh, they, they also uh, typically have a seven-year lockup, do they not? Yes. Yeah. And so in... In what you put together with uh, um, I, I, using other means that you talked about in, uh, to create liquidity, et cetera, is you've got it down to a three-year lockup for uh, for these clients. So we we talk about this in the way that when you, if you look at your portfolio as a well of water, mm -hmm. the, the money that we're looking to allocate towards this is at the bottom of the well. So when you put your bucket in to take some of that uh, those investments out for cash flow um, or or any needs, you're taking from the top of that water in the well. You're never ever going down to the bottom of that and and needing that money. If if you are, then this isn't the investment for you. Uh, so is that a fair representation? I think it, it, it's very fair. You know, we ran some analysis, and you know, I'd love. If it was, you know, 30 to 50% of, of client portfolios, you know, similar to what CPP and, and for younger clients that that might work really well um, for clients that need liquidity or they're going to know, you know, in five years, I'm, I need that money that, you know, it's not the right investment for the entirety of your portfolio. The analysis that we ran in terms of what does this do to a client's portfolio if I had 10% out of a global balance fund where I assumed a global balance fund looks like most client portfolios where you've got some bonds, you've got some stocks, you know, what is, you know, adding 10% do again, just using index data and not accounting for, you know, you know, individual funds of performing. We saw that it was additive to returns, reductive to volatility, and therefore that efficiency or the return per unit of risk went materially higher. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've gone through that data and it's pretty impressive what just a 10% exposure can do. Mm -hmm. Um and and so if people are wondering, uh currently what we would think of is again, depending on the client, but we're uh we would probably max out somewhere around the 20% mark. It would give it a chance to uh, uh to grow a little bit uh before we had to start trimming it back. Um, another quick note too on this is uh, us saying uh, about needing cash flow. Um, these portfolios actually do kick off cash flow, do they not? Mm -hmm. they, yeah. they do. So uh, uh, our CI Private Markets Growth Fund, which we uh, seeded in February, we started making an investments. Then um, we are invested with a Canadian investor in this uh, private equity space, very niche part of the private equity space. And they um, their investing style allows them to return capital to investors very, very quickly. So we've already received distributions uh, from that uh, in, uh, investment already. Yeah, great. We talked about it a little bit, but is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of who would be the ad uh, ideal client uh, for this type of private market investment? I, I don't think there is an, an ideal claim. You know, it's 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 really specific to their their risk tolerance. Um, I think, you know, a client that's always on top of the market and 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 sees the Toronto Stock Exchange or the S and P up, you know, twenty or thirty percent, which which can happen in any given year. This may not be the product for them because it's generally going to be smoother returns, and so that means smooth the returns to the upside and smooth the returns to the downside. Uh, so overall, long term, I think it can be very accretive to investors, but um, I, I would just keep that in the back of, of your mind and, and condition your clients that, you know, you can see, you know, some 
seven large technology stocks on the NASDAQ or the S&P absolutely tearing it up based on the prospects of, of AI. Uh, and you know these are not the investments that can really boogie. It's a very scientific term. They can't boogie the, uh, uh, with the same speed. Yes, 100%. So uh, yeah, the uh, it's interesting. We go back to that testing that you were talking about. And when I looked at uh, the analysis, one of the things that it showed there was uh, since 2005, the uh, the returns for Nasdaq S and P five hundred the returns over that period of time uh, for the private market portfolios were very similar, but if we go back to what you talked about before, it was literally half the volatility of those. So that's that smoothing effect. You're not going to necessarily get these hit it out of the ballpark years. Um, but, uh, that's, that's not why we're putting it in there. It has to do with the correlations and, and giving a much more consistent return, right? Correct. So from there, uh, what, um, can you give some of the, uh, some examples of, uh, what type of investments are in the, uh, uh, the private equity side or, and, and maybe broaden that out to infrastructure as well. Right. So um, we will be including the CI Harbor Vest infrastructure income fund within our CI private markets growth and CI private market income funds. Uh, and they hold right now, I think seven direct investments. Um, there's a shipping container company as an, you know, play on global infrastructure. There's a, there's a Washington-based uh, electric utility. Um, I, private equity is fascinating. You know, the, it can be, um, I, I put it into three categories. It, it's kind of fix, build, or engineer. And, and the fixing is, and we've partnered with, um, in our funds, American Industrial Partners, and they're a bunch of a, a bunch of engineers that go in and fix industrial companies, whether it's their manufacturing process, their supply chains, and this is how they add value to companies. So they don't buy a company with a lot of debt um, and hope that they can grow revenue. They, you know, they're looking at, at fixing companies. There's also, I'd say, the build category, which is, you know, can I by providing additional growth capital, can this company then be a consolidator of an industry? Can it, um, can, can it grow by, you know, spending more intelligently and, and more on R&D and then growing the business? And one of the companies we're involved in called Demopolis, it kind of specializes in that. And then there's a big part of the business, which I would call financial engineering, which uh, typically requires a lot of debt. So a private equity investor might put in 30, 40 percent of the capital as equity and then borrow the rest. Um, and it tends to rely on growing the business and hoping that you can get paid more for the business in five years time when you're selling it than you bought it for. Uh, and that's in my mind, less, a lot less attractive. I think it was, re it's reliant on cheap debt. And I think the era of cheap debt is behind us. It feels like to me, that's just an index return of private equity. It's, it's not what we in the business would call alpha in terms of being you know, real performance. So that's not something that we're, we're looking at at all. That's um, actually, can I just interrupt for a second? Because that's actually a really good point, Jeff. And uh, uh, when I've been talking about this lately, the, the companies that we are dealing with are not the companies that, uh, so it, it'd be the same thing in Toronto, but in Vancouver, uh, for the last number of years, there's all these small private equity uh, uh, groups that have been raising capital from uh, investors and they're running around trying to buy uh, businesses, small, medium-sized businesses that uh, to do exactly what you're talking about. The, the firms that we use, and um, this is incredibly important, don't go out and chase deals. The management teams that are top tier are always top tier. And that's because they've been around, they've got a, a great niche, a great reputation, and the deals, the deals that are the best deals come to them first, 
and what maybe they take five percent of them uh and then it's you talk the wheat and the chaff well the chaff falls down you you don't want to be dealing with the ones that are taking the leftovers uh, you are absolutely correct so that's really two ways how the private markets are different than the public markets so one is we do tend to see more persistence of outperformance so the top quartile managers um, tend to uh, stay top quartile managers more consistently in the private markets than in the public markets the other big difference is we see a greater dispersion of returns so that top manager versus the bottom manager um, that might be 20%, 30% return difference between them, where in the public market, that might be 5 8%. So it, what it means is picking the right managers is much more important in the private markets than it is the public markets. Yeah, that, that's thanks. Thanks for being a little more succinct. I tend to run on. <laughs> that's uh, uh, very well put. And, uh, and just to put a real point on it is, just because uh, after hearing this, don't go run out and buy something that's called private equity, because it's like anything, you have to understand what you're getting. And uh, quality, quality, quality is so important when it comes to this. So just to give you an example, you know, we'll look at an investable universe of about 11,000 funds. And then we screen it by, you know, which funds are open which funds will partner with us, which funds have a repeatable, stable process and competitive advantage, which funds have competitive performance, you know, not a lot of drawdown in, in bad markets. And we just keep winnowing this, uh, you know, in, investor universe of 11,000 funds down further and further, you know, with quantitative screens. Uh, we use an independent, um, or an external independent um, agency called Mercer, uh, consulting to to help with this database. We meet with the managers a number of times before we went it down to really a portfolio portfolio of you know eight company or eight funds. So that's that's pretty. It's a lot of work goes into this. It's it's uh, what we call the due diligence part. It's uh, not uh, not necessarily fun. Well, I guess some people think it's fun. But, <laughs> but uh, it, it's it's incredibly necessary. Any other example, say on the on the credit side of companies that you would sure. uh, or situation? Yeah, so yeah, so just like how private equity can be different, uh, private credit can be different. It can be um, you know it can be a loan that's you know not broadly syndicated out to other banks or, or other investors. It can be distressed investing where. You can buy the debt at pennies on the dollar, and you you want to end up owning that business. It can be direct lending to small and medium sized businesses. Um, I've been doing a fair amount of, of private credits in the CI portfolios for a number of years. One thing we did earlier this year uh, with two other investors was a four hundred million dollar term loan to a Ontario based gold company called I Am Gold, which was building out a a, a mine in, with a joint venture with Mitsubishi. So the trouble is they're building it out and COVID hit. So they you know, ran into cost overruns and inflation. And so they needed to additional capital and the bond market was essentially closed to them, but they needed additional capital to finish building out this, this mine, which looks like when it's built will be a, you know, a first quartile mine in terms of um, size and, and cost per ounce. Um, so the company was doing the right things. It was it was selling other assets to raise capital, and we came in and we came in based on a network relationship that we had. And we didn't do the four all the whole four hundred million dollars, but we did forty million of it. And it's you know basically overnight rates, so floating rates plus eight and a quarter percent. So it's about thirteen and a half percent paper for a second lien on um, their interest in the mine, and it's almost completely built and the rest of the company's assets. And I suspect this loan gets refinanced much cheaper in a year or two's time. So we've got some experience in, um, in this part of the market. Um, what the managers that were involved with, they can do loans like that. They can also do you know, distressed investing. So one of the managers that we're about to um, sign documents with and commit for the funds is a distressed investor. Um, they were telling me about how 
uh, in 2020, they were looking at the debt of NPC. When that name didn't mean anything to me, but they're currently the largest um, franchisor of, of Pizza Hut and uh, Wendy's franchises. It's like a master franchisor. And they were not set up for delivery. The, the debt was trading during COVID or in middle of 2020 at 40 cents to the dollar. And they bought the debt and they're ready to own that business with a view of selling it later on. And it turns out that one of the uh, one of the other larger franchisees came in as the market was beginning to reopen and, and recover and, and was willing to pay them 95 cents for that debt. And they said, look, we're 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 this is you know operating a business is different than fixing a balance sheet. Uh, and you know, we don't want to operate business, we want to make money. And that was a, a trade that they were you know, happy to, to monetize. Another one of the investors, again, that we're about to sign documents with, uh, got involved in Cirque du Soleil during COVID, that this is a world-class franchise with a broken balance sheet. And it's much easier to fix a balance sheet than it is to fix a broken business. You know, broken businesses, your, your costs are too high, you're not growing, you're not competitive. Broken balance sheet, it's a little bit, savage but a broken balance sheet you can fix with the bankruptcy process you know you've got to take the keys away from the equity owners and say you've defaulted on the debt it's my turn to, to turn this business around and and sell it and make money for my investors and so uh, and they uh they had a successful exit of Cirque du Soleil as the um economy recovered the leisure economy recovered post-COVID yeah that's that's fascinating that's that's something that uh I really enjoyed hearing about are the uh, the different opportunities, the different businesses, the different debt uh, that uh, uh, our our managers have been working with. So it is just fascinating, and maybe just circle back to uh, um, you know some of the things I know that we have uh, if we talk about uh, the Harbor Vest uh, and investments is. Uh, um, wind farms uh so there's also a lot of if you look um the the renewable the uh um the name is escaping me now that uh, it was such a uh, uh, energy uh, energy transition uh, or, yeah and yeah. that's a, a massive growth market as we look at you know companies and individual projects and and just um ener uh, electricity generation that you know needs to be more sustainable, uh, yeah. and and what are the, the the business opportunities that follow kind of those required investments, and so it can be wind, it can be battery technology, uh, it can go in so many different directions, and that will be part of, of where we dedicate um, our infrastructure allocation within these funds. Yeah, fascinating. So with all that, uh, and and I know I could talk about this for, uh, forever with you because I, I do just find it uh, uh, amazing what's out there. And I, I love this uh, uh, vehicle of investing. Um, what's the outlook for private uh, market investments over the next five to 10 years? So we've got a lot of volatility in the markets right now. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's been a tough, uh, few years, especially in the bond market. Um, uh, the, uh, volatility is, is not going away. Um, you talked about the correlation. So in other words, private markets perform differently than public markets, not necessarily in sync. Uh, um, and I always talk about when, when we're looking to create a, a portfolio, we're building a portfolio much like a car engine, uh, and the the cylinders are all supposed to fire at separate times, uh, and that gives you the smooth ride. Uh, what we had happen in 2022 in just the public markets is everything fired at once mm -hmm. <laughs> and blew up the engine, so to speak. Uh, uh, and that can happen. It has happened in the past. Uh, but uh, again, private markets... It, how does it, it's had a, a, a good run over the last, last number of years? Is it done? Uh, it, what's, what's the outlook? Yeah, great question. Um, and I, I think it's important to state that the private markets are not going to be immune from what's happening in the real economy and by extension, what's happening in the public markets. Um, 
So it's, it's not a panacea, it's just a lower volatility expression of economic growth and, 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 and growing companies. Um, you know, let's take real estate. Public real estate was down 20 to 30% in 2022 as, as basically as, as interest rates moved higher, kind of that steady at any asset class kind of looks like a bond, you know, a little bit of growth, but a, you know, a lot of cash flow had to reprice um, lower as the yields went, went higher. Uh, and again, they're, they're down slightly this year with the move higher in government bond yields. Private real estate generally has not moved nearly as much. And that's partly because a lot of transactions aren't happening. Now, all real estate is not office and retail. And I think the headwinds in retail are, are well understood with work from home. And we're starting to appreciate the headwinds in office in terms of overcapacity and, 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 and work from home. Um, but I've had you know, a private um, real estate equity investor say, I'm not particularly interested, interested in owning private real estate equity at this point. He's more excited about making loans into the real estate space on great terms, basically with yields now that looked like the equity terms that he thought he could get five years ago. So he's happy to lend into real estate, but until prices reset, doesn't want to be an owner. And that works really, really well for our strategy. So um, just to give you a sense of, uh, you know, sometimes we can see that, that disconnect. Um, private credit, given the move higher in, in bond yields, is very attractive to investors right now. It's getting a lot of attention. A lot of that asset class is floating rate. Um, so it hasn't been impacted as much by the move higher in, in, in yields. Uh, and we like private credit. Um, private credit, and we're overweight that part in our portfolios. And I think maybe the next trade in terms of where we want to focus is really on the private equity side, owning companies, that if it's expensive to borrow, it's going to exclude all but the best buyers and managers of assets from, from owning assets. And I think that will accrue to their benefit in terms of higher returns. I think about, you know, what's the one thing that you have 100% control over that you can buy a company, you can change the management team and reorient the product shelf. But the one thing that you have 100% control over is when and how much is when you buy and how much you pay for. And that discipline and the discipline that the managers that we've partnered with show, I think, accrues to our investors' benefits. So in a nutshell, I think private markets, the size of the private markets, um, increases, it increases um, within Canada Pension Plan and other sophisticated institutional investors, pension plans. I think it will increase in importance to retail investors, to you know average investors. And I think it, given what it can do in a diversified portfolio in terms of increasing returns without increasing volatility or actually suppressing volatility, I think it will go, it, I think it will become something that maybe in 2000, 23 is nice to have to by 2025 it's, it's a must-have in client portfolios yeah yeah and uh goes go goes back to why over if it was i think 2015 when we first ventured into this uh uh it's not like it wasn't thought of before that but that's a, a good eight call it probably 10 years that uh the thought process of, of bringing this to our clients uh uh, and now what we've what you've really done with Mark Andre is uh, uh, brought it down to uh, more investors level. Uh, Correct. And so and what's incredibly important, I can't stress this enough, is the world class top tier managers to that level, because I know there's other funds out there. Um, but again, you you have to be very, very careful of what uh, what you're looking at. And, and we're not beholden to any one manager, right? If if we've picked a manager and they're not performing, they're off the shelf. You know, they're they're out of the fund or yeah. we're not subscribing to their next fund. So it's a it's multi-manager, it's open architecture. You can see our underlying investments. Yeah. That's outstanding. Jeff, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, um I, I get uh 
I get excited during these podcasts and I always say, I think every episode I've said this, but uh, I, I learn so much when I do these and uh, this is no different. Uh, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure, anytime. A big thank you again to Jeff Marshall for giving us insight into what private markets are and why for the right client, they're a key piece to a portfolio. Our next plan podcast is about disinheriting CRA, but in a charitable way. I'll be joined by my partner, Josh Dick, and we'll explore ways in which our clients are fulfilling their charitable desires with the added benefit of significantly reducing, or in some cases, eliminating what is given to CRA. Ultimately, our goal is to educate and engage you, our audience. If you have any topics you would like us to dive deeper into, please let us know. If you could take a moment to post a review, it would be much appreciated. If you would like access to other videos and podcasts or articles we have done, visit us at saunafamilyoffice.com. And for those of you who don't know the origin of the name Sauna Family Office, it stems from the meaning of Asante, which is Swahili for thank you. However, the most commonly spoken phrase in Swahili regarding Asante is Asante Sana, which means thank you very much. This name represents our gratitude towards all the families and business owners who have chosen our team as their trusted advisory council. Until next time, Asante Sana. Hi, I'm Trevor Beggs from Sana Family Office, and thanks for listening to John Lawson and the Wealth Wisdom Podcast. Here are the necessary disclosures. Asante Capital Management is a member of the Canadian Investor Protection Fund and Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada. This material is provided for general information and is subject to change without notice. Every effort has been made to compile this material from reliable sources, However, no warranty can be made as to its accuracy or completeness. Before acting on any of the above, please make sure to see a professional advisor for individual financial advice based on your personal circumstances. The opinions expressed here are not necessarily those of Asante Capital Management. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time on the Wealth Wisdom Podcast.